Welcome to Channel 18 News. I'm Jim Rogers. 23 indictments have been handed down by a Hopkins County grand jury for the month of November. Eight of the indictments were sealed awaiting the arrest of the indicted individuals. For a list of those indicted, go to KSSTRadio.com. When Hopkins County Deputy Shaw served a warrant on Christopher David Brockmill, age 26, he was found at the probation office. The warrant was for delivery of marijuana over a quarter of an ounce, but less than five pounds in a drug-free zone. At the time of the arrest, Brockmill informed the officer that he was intoxicated on methamphetamine. He's in Hopkins County Jail on a state jail felony. A caller to the Hopkins County Sheriff's Dispatch said an assault was taking place involving a knife. When deputies responded to the assault on County Road 1218, they found the victim and the suspect. The deputy was told that Georgia Allen George, age 54, of Brashear had brandished a knife while assaulting her daughter. The daughter also stated that George had thrown the knife at her, causing the knife to stick in the wall of the residence. Photos of the scene, the victim, and George were taken. The daughter also filed an emergency protective order against her mother. George is in Hopkins County Jail being held on aggravated assault, family with a weapon. She, her bond has been set at $50,000. November 19th at 4 p.m., residents of the city of Sulphur Springs are invited to attend one at Celebration Plaza. The event will feature all present singing what the world needs now is love, sweet love. The event is to focus on the development of a moment of unity for all who live in the city of Sulphur Springs, according to city manager Mark Maxwell. We're calling it One, and that event will happen November 19th at 4 p.m. That's a Saturday. Um, and rather than explain it, I would really like your viewers and those who find this by reason of your web page, um, I'd like them to follow the link. This is, it was a couple of days after the horrible police shootings in Dallas. And, and I, was, I was really struck then and, and, and I, before and even after about how much anger and hatred is in the world and how little love is in the world. And, and, and after that, I, I, like everyone, was terribly saddened by it. And then I see this video of people coming together to sing hallelujah. And it was very, very touching. And, and I knew immediately we need to do that here and often. <laughs> and, and so um, we, we had a little event on the square and it didn't quite come off like I intended. It was more of a, it was great and people loved it. And, uh, and everybody did a great job, but the show was on stage. And, and people kind of scattered throughout the square and, and they watched the show and some of them sang along and, and, uh, and, and everybody wished it had gone on longer because they had that great of a time. But what I want to do is I want to turn it around backwards. There's somebody up on the stage leading, but the show is out in the audience. The show is the audience. It's, and, I, and I want to get a few thousand people on the square all singing, and the song not going to be Hallelujah like you just heard, but it'll be what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And so we're gonna, Shannon ask you from Morning Chapel Church is going to lead the group. Um, and we've got a very special uh, young man named Micah who's going to be lead vocals. I think he's 10 years old and he's just, he's great. And, um, and, uh, Calvin Hickerson is going to be the accompaniment. Those are the only three people on stage. And like I say, the show is out there, and and so um, we're going to lead, we're going to learn an arrangement of what the world needs now, and sing it and videotape it, uh, just like what you saw here. A very professional uh, job of videotaping it. It's going to be, I predict. A, uh, a very moving event that the people who go will never forget. Um, and then I suspect people aren't going to want to leave. And so if we hang, hang around and sing old gospel favorites for a while, well, that just might happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 
I realize that, you know, being caught in the moment, that, that prompted you to do this, but, but what other promptings do you have for this? Well, so I, I told you that um, it hangs heavy on my heart the amount of anger that there is in the world. And what a better place the world would be if we uh, felt love one for another. And that is, that is what this is about. Because you, you watch that and you see 1,500 people that don't know each other come together. Um, and there had to be a feeling of oneness. So we want a couple thousand, three thousand, whatever we can get together from every walk of life, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, everybody. And I predict that when we do for a moment, as we stand there and sing with one voice, we'll have this feeling that we're all basically the same. And um, that's, that's the event. We're calling it one, just to keep it simple. And I think it'll be, um, like I say, something we won't forget. Every city manager has dreams for his city. Obviously dreams that uh, talk about you know, the, the economic benefits, the, the lifestyle of, of, of the community. Um, do you think you're taking it a step further here uh, with, with concerns for just the unity of the people within the community? I, I, I feel that, okay, so people tend to think of their city, or they can uh, think of their city in strictly physical terms. It's streets and water and sewer and parks and fire and police. And, and, and yeah, we do those things. And, and, and that is, you know, one would say core to what we do. Um, but people should have an emotional connection with their city. Um, and uh, to the extent that we can do that, and it, I think... I think Sulphur Springs is already very, very special. I've thought that since I got here. Yeah, and, and, I, and I don't think I'm alone in that. Of course, you know, a lot of people out there think their, their community is special. Some don't, but uh, I, I think it's fairly unanimous here in Sulphur Springs that we've, we've got something pretty special. And, and let's capitalize on it. City Manager Mark Maxwell tells us about Crosstown Trail and some street improvements that will be made in the city of Sulphur Springs in the near future. Well, yeah, this is the trail that connects Buford Park to Coleman Park um, in, on, along two different paths. We have two grants. We have uh, one grant from TxDOT that will actually connect downtown through Buford Park to Coleman Park. And so well, it's, it's it's paying for a new sidewalk on one side of Connolly Street, and then um, pathway through the park, uh, and then it will cross the railroad tracks. Um, we were going to cross at Gladys Alexander, but there was problems uh, uh, with the school that wasn't going to work for them, and and so we got to look in, and it looks like the best place to cross really will be between the old AMPI building and uh, what is now the CNB Data Processing Center across the creek. We own the land in between, and, and CNB has, has indicated if there's some, some land that, if we don't have quite enough or something, that they, they would love to work with us. So uh, either way, it looks like that's gonna be a good way to cross, and we'll be doing some clearing out there as soon as we take a look at what we got. And, and then the other pathway, and this will be paid for by the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission. Of course, we have matching on both of these grants, but, but for the most part, they're paid for by these grants. Uh, we'll, we'll head um, from the park. It'll basically be a new sidewalk down the east side of the park. It'll cross uh, Main Street at League and continue south till just before the... Um, uh, the electrical substation. There's a little tiny road there. It'll take that road and the road dead ends and, and then there's some property back there that has to be acquired and some that we already own and then voila, we're at the park. So now we've got a little loop between the parks and once you get to the parks, you've got all these different options of, of uh, paths you can take. So it really helps 
build a, a pretty substantial trail system in the city. Now, when you talk about the uh, sidewalk on Conway and so forth, are you going to enlarge that sidewalk, make it any wider, or uh, is it going to be about the same width? Do you know? Uh, it's, it's a little bit more sidewalk, a little bit less grass on the street side. Um, it, that's in general, but you need to know that in some places the sidewalks are a little closer to the street than others, and some, you know, and so it's there's a lot of engineering that happens along the Conway Street path. But in general, I, th I think we end up with a six foot sidewalk, and then I think it's four foot now. All right, yeah, that'll allow for people to uh, really have a nice, oh, yeah. leisurely walk. Yeah, and and remember, part of what makes a downtown successful, it's live, work, and play are the, the three ingredients. And, and we always had the work portion of the recipe downtown, and that was never a problem. Uh, but we didn't have much of, of live and uh, play. Well, we've got play now. We've got entertainment, and we've got, we've got dining, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's going well. The residential, the living downtown itself is fairly limited, but we have significant residential right next door with really crummy sidewalks to get them there. <laughs> so and so this will be beneficial to downtown as well, uh, as well as those who just want to take a nice walk on uh, uh, an extensive trail system. And we expect work to begin on this? Oh, we're probably 60 days away from doing anything, maybe longer. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of engineering that has to be done in the meantime. Along with sidewalks, we talk about streets. Uh, you've been working on Locust. Yes, yeah, so Locust Street has begun. That's, a, that's another rebuild like, uh, like Bill Bradford. And Moore Street right next to it will be behind that. And then we've still got to do, I forget if it's Pamper or Plano. We've done one, but not the other. We've got to go back and catch the other one. And then we've got a big sewer line replacement project that we've got to do up by the hospital. So and then that will complete that capital improvement program that we started back in 2012, and uh, and then it'll be time to adopt a new one. The new capital improvement program. How soon do you think you will be talking about that? Oh, we're a year away. Other projects that you're coming to completion on? Uh, so so uh, the summer paving program that sometimes doesn't happen in the summer uh, we're about to do and we, we've chosen the uh, the work that we're going to do so Woodside in the Woodbridge edition we'll get some concrete work good uh, yeah <laughs> true as president of the homeowners you're Association. glad to hear that thank you <laughs> yeah so we, we do what we can uh, Hodge Street will be repaved from Brinker to Davis Lewis will be repaved from College to Lakeshore. Lover's Lane, which is in really bad shape, gets repaved from, from um, Highway 67 to the railroad tracks. Uh, Parkins gets repaved from Broadway to Fisher. Putman gets repaved from Gilmer to Oak. Uh, I think that's right alongside of where the rock is. Uh, Tate gets repaved from League to Texas, and Veterans Drive gets repaved from um, uh, Como Street to the uh, to the interstate. We'll also repave portions of the the road that are in Coleman Park, and we have various other big soft spots just here and there around town designated for repairs. So, so that's going to get started pretty soon as well. Here's Don Julian with sports. Here are the latest Wildcats football statistics going into Friday's home game against Hallsville. The Wildcats are 3-6 and six for the season. That's the district's third best record. In district play, the Wildcats are in a four-way tie for third place with a mark of 2-3. and three. For the season, the Wildcats have averaged scoring 26.1 points per game, and they have given up an average of 33.6 points a game. In district play alone, the Wildcats are averaging 23.2 points a game, and they're allowing an average of 25.2 points per game. 
In yards gained, the Wildcats have the number two offense in the district, averaging 366.1 yards per game. Their defense is ranked number four, giving up 365.1 yards per game. In turnover, plus and minus, the Wildcats are even for the season. They have lost five fumbles and thrown eight interceptions for a total of 13. They've recovered nine fumbles and had four passes intercepted for a total of 13. In rushing, back Cern Rogers is eighth in the district with 519 yards. Back Colton Allen is 13th in the district with 383 yards. Back Kaysen Goodson is 15th in the district with 279 yards. In passing, quarterback Ryan Humphreys is number two in the district, having completed 122 of 221 passes. That's 55% for 1,650 yards with 14 touchdowns and eight interceptions. In receiving, receiver Simeon Taylor, number two in district with 49 catches. And receiver Cortavius Pruitt is tied for ninth in the district with 16 catches. In punting, kicker Angel Tavera, number two in district, averaging 33.37 yards a kick on 35 punts. In punt returns, Taylor's fourth in the district averaging 3.83 yards on six punt returns. In kickoff returns, Goodson is ninth in district, averaging 19.29 yards on seven kickoff returns. In interceptions, safety DJ Abron is tied for third in district with two interceptions. Team's uh, leading scores are Tavera with 37 points and Taylor with 36. In scoring by kickers alone, Tavera's number two in the district with his 37 points. That's on 25 extra point kicks and four field goals. On defense, leaders in combined tackles and assists are linebacker Jackson Renault with 47, linebacker Easton Silman 44, and Abron with 41. In sacks, the team has 16, and the team leaders are defensive lineman Deidrick Dugan with seven, defensive lineman Haven Tennyson with four, and Silman with two. And nine different players have recovered fumbles. Silman, cornerback Terrell Terman, safety Austin Dodd, Dugan, Abron, defensive lineman Tyrese Pryor, linebacker Daniel Marino, defensive lineman Jose Rodriguez, and safety Trey Dial. Thanks for watching Channel 18 News. Have a great evening.